Okay, welcome to Meet the Artist. Today we have Ben Grenfeld and I'm happy that he's here because he's not over here too often and in the moment it's getting difficult because of Corona. But he's here, so hi Ben, nice to meet you again. Nice to meet you, Andreas. Yeah, Germany is a special place for Scandinavian musicians because uh, we can, Finland is a small country, so I tour here twice a year. And well, this year I've already cancelled two tours okay. because of Corona. And, and you know, everybody was, everyone suffers and suffered from it really badly since February, mid February. Yeah. But uh, gigs are coming back, restricted, but still. So Hopefully. it's nice to be here. And, and now I'm here with uh, what we call 1242 12 guitar strings, 4 bass strings, and 2 drumsticks. It's not the IQ of the band members, but <laughs> uh, that's uh, Thomas Blog and me on guitar and Martin Engelin on bass yeah, and yeah. then uh, Bernie Bowens on drums. And we're having a great time, so. Nice. German beer and good music. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Yes. We've been known us uh, for quite a long time now. I, st I think it started about 2004 or so. Uh, 2001 or two. Oh, okay. From I, I, uh, we were in Ron Mail's uh, shop. What's it called? Uh, Pro guitar. Pro guitar. Pro guitar. Yeah. And, ah, yeah. And there I even. Yeah, he said that. Hey, I was there with Andy Powell from Wishbone Ash when I was playing. Yeah, you with playing Wishbone. with Wishbone Ash. Yeah, and, and then the time. he said you have to try these pickups. And I'm like, what are these? He said it's my friend who makes them and. And then we got a set each I got for my, for my Strat and he got for his Flying V. And since then, I want to change all my pickups within half a year. And so you've, you've been a major part of de developing my tone, so to speak. So, Great. Yeah, and since then, we've, you know, we've, we don't only talk about pickups and guitars. We've, we've met and spoke about other things in life. Talk about, well. li yeah. about life, yes. Yeah. So, if so like you I said, that you're a friend. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, you're a friend. Ben is my friend. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ben, uh, you talked about tone. How does a musician develop his tone? How did you get there? Well, when, when favorites. You, well, when you start, I think that since you don't know what tone is, you listen to what the other players that you like have. So in, in my youth, it was, you know, Richie Blackmore was the first one that I kind of really idolized. Uh, Jeff Beck, Gary Moore, David Gilmore, Robin Trower, yeah. uh, basically Strat players in the beginning, also or Gary Moore, also Les Paul. But you try to copy what the sound they have, and you know before YouTube and internet, you had no. I, you know, I I lived in a small town outside of Helsinki, Finland, and I didn't know anything. I just you know, I saved money when I worked in the summer, and, and every month I would buy a pedal knowing, without knowing what it was. Uh, what about a guitar? What was your the, first guitar my then? My first guitar was an SG copy. Okay. I can't remember the brand, but then I got, I think it was an Ibanez Strat. Okay. And before I even heard about Van Halen, I rooted a humbucker in it too, ah. in the rhythm position. You were the first. No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, the Strat was the thing for me. And as I said, you know, you, I had a little transistor amplifier and, and I would buy pedals just basically almost by the looks. I remember buying a compressor pedal and taking it back the next day. This does nothing to the sound. It just makes it whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know what it was supposed to do. Yeah. And, you know, there, there wasn't that many. I remember when the electric mistress flanger, flanger came out. Yeah. I remember, when, you know, the nice tube toy. screamer thing and, and yeah. all that. Um, did you already have bands back then? Yeah, of course, in school we had, you know, I, 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 I'm one year younger than the, the guys that have the band that everybody liked in school. So I would go to see their rehearsals and I would go to see all the gigs they played okay. until I could form my own band. And uh, obviously, you, I remember, yeah, the, the, the lead singer playing guitar, but he had a maestro fuss, like this really weird looking pedal with these two big wheels on the side for okay. drive and volume. Yeah, so and I was like, wow, <laughs> that was like the best thing. And the other gu lead guitar player had a uh, Gibson SG and nobody had a Gibson in town. And that was b about in the 80s or earlier? Uh, or yeah, early 80s, very early. early or 80s. late, no, late uh, 70s, because yeah, I started late playing 70s. when I was 11. I'm born oh, okay. 63, so 74. Yeah, I would say late 70s. Late 70s, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah, that, that was, 
I mean, we didn't know anything. As I said, there was no YouTube. So you just had to, yeah. what's happening when I do this and what's happening do that. And how, you know, I listened to this album. He has something strange in his sound. Oh, it's delay, echo. Wow. So I bought an Echoplex. And before that, I had an analog delay. But, you know, those are, and the Marshall was like the big, wow, I have a Marshall. But obviously they were so loud that you couldn't really play with them anywhere. Did you work for the money or this, all these yeah, things? Yeah. No, uh, no. I, 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 every summer I worked the whole summer, uh, summer jobs, and whatever I would get, otherwise, you know, like weak money or something, I saved. Yeah. Either to buy records or to buy pedals or st uh, strings, I saved them because I cooked the strings. So when this they were was dirty. always the most important thing in your life. Yeah, that was. This. Actually, like equipment. a bit of a sad story, or not sad, but it's a true story that my mother and father got divorced when I was 11. And that's when I started playing guitar. Oh, okay. And uh, my brother took it really hard, but I didn't notice anything because I was only playing guitar all the time. I see. That was uh, up till about when I was 15, I started martial arts. And that those two have been, are a major part of my life. Oh, but okay. my mother showed me some years ago pictures of like from school and said look at your brother how he looks and he looked sad and had dark rings under his eyes and I looked like like I'm thinking about a Fender Strat or something. <laughs> you had <laughs> your I music. Didn't not, yeah, I didn't notice anything. I oh, was okay. so into playing and you know you I wouldn't say practice because I never sat down and practiced scales or or fast picking. I just played and played. Just Put play on music, my favorite yeah. 10 albums terrorize the neighbors <laughs> until they would knock on the door and say, that's enough. You have tried this dive bomb now for one hour. <laughs> <laughs> that was from Band of Gypsies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. But then later on, obviously, tone develops, I think, mainly from, from your soul and your fingers. And uh, if you find a guitar that you like, and, and as you start, you don't know what guitar is best for you. You just of buy whatever not. your idols have. Yeah. You know, so first a Strat copy and then a real Strat. And uh, when you, your ear develops and you know, so oh, my sound is really trebly. Well, I can turn the treble down instead of putting everything on 10. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean that it's the best sound if you put everything <laughs> on 10. So it's a, it's a delicate thing, but I think that well, I like to think that I have a good guitar tone and, and a lot of it comes from the touch. Of course, yeah. How, how to pick, how to yeah, feel the tone. And, and yeah. you know, it's like when, when, in retrospect, I didn't know that you were playing guitar when, when I got the first pickups and when we met. And then later you sent me a file of video of you playing, I think Pink Floyd or something like that. Yeah. Fuck me, does he play guitar too? <laughs> this is unfair. <laughs> <laughs> I did it before, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But that means that you know what you're doing because, you know. Yes, of course. Yeah. I've been on stages since the late 70s, yeah. as you did. Yeah. And I guess I was very lucky because my, my dream was to play guitar, in, have a local band with my friends and work in a guitar store. And I now you worked in a guitar yeah, store. I so. worked like, I, I lived 20 minutes from Helsinki. So I, I would take the train in and there's a vintage shop called Kitarapaya, which would be like musik laden or something, mm. or guitar laden. Okay. And uh, I would go and sit there. They, they, they had no Japanese guitars, only old vintage guitars and, and oh, great. some newer stuff. But they were the, the guitar store in the whole of Finland. So everybody who was something would come there from other cities oh, and okay. visit. And uh, I was there so much that the guy said, well, you know, after I had to go to the army when I was 18, but when I came out and I sat there every day for a couple of hours. You were here anyway, so yeah. you, so work you might us. as well start working. But the real <laughs> truth was, I'm a Swedish speaking Finn, and they were Finns, in Sp they didn't speak ah, okay. Swedish, and they had a lot of customers who would call from Sweden and from uh, other cities, in, like the west coast of Finland, that has a lot of Swedish speaking people. And every, when I was there, I said, ah, oh, uh, wait a minute, just tell him that we have it, and ben. you know. And so then I, I kind of gradually got into it, and my finish was really bad then. So when they left me alone, one Saturday there, I said, "Oh, we leave already one. We clo close up at two. And I thought, "There's nobody coming in." And suddenly there's this bunch of guys from this quite famous band came in, and and they talked so fast in Finnish that I panicked. I'm like, "I don't know what to say. I don't speak that good Finnish," you know. They, I, 
I remember them asking about Strat something, and I didn't at that time. I, I freaked out, and I didn't remember that Fender changed like to Rosewood fingerboard in '59. And the, one of the guys said, "Don't you even know that? And you work here?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Mama, help me!" <laughs> but you know, I learned a lot from there. Obviously, small repairs, and I could sit there and try out everything that came in. Every pedal, every they they, they were deal, dealers for Mesa Boogie. Martin guitars, like acoustic guitars, and uh, electric guitars they had. At that time, I think when I worked, they started having ESP, but obviously the vintage side. So you were always in touch with professional equipment yeah. at that time. And professionals that would come in, so pe yeah, people okay. I would go and see at gigs. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And one funny thing is that in 79, I was still a customer there, and I got my first guitar player magazine. And there was an interview with Ann Wilson and uh, the band Heart, basically. Yeah, yeah. And I think the guitar player's name was Roger Fisher. And he said, yeah, I got this new thing. It's called a Floyd Rose. Like one of those <laughs> yes. first ones. And, and there was the address to Floyd Rose that you could write him if you, you know. Yeah. So I wrote to him. I said, I'm Ben Grantham from Finland. I would like to purchase one of these. And in January, I got the reply from him was, yes, I can send you over. Any qualified luthier can put this on your guitar. And I took it very proudly to Kitarapaya. This is for, but before I worked there. I said, I would like to put this on my guitar. And I will never work, that's bullshit, never. <laughs> Buy this ESP thing, it's much better, which was totally shit. <laughs> then when I started working there a couple of years later, I became, they started importing Floyd Rose and Kramer guitars. And I probably sold more Floyd Roses in Finland than anybody else and Kramer guitars. And it was, I was the Floyd Rose expert. Right. Yeah, that's a funny little story. I still somewhere have the letter from, from Floyd Rose himself. So. so he must be quite thankful to you to well, bring this thing over to I think to Europe. Kramer, Kramer probably was the one that <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they had when it. They, when they licensed it and had it on every They had guitar. it exclusively in their guitars yeah. for, for a time then. Yeah. You weren't, you have, if you wanted to purchase a Floyd Rose system, you had to buy a Kramer guitar yeah. and take it out of there. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, and then I think yeah. Schaller later, Schaller in Germany got the license and they started building yeah, them Yeah, well. and then the, um, um, the Rockinger, Rockinger guys made this true tune tremolo yeah, which, similar yeah. to that. that was, that's how you destroy vintage guitars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your first professional band then? Well, professional, first professional band was uh, uh, with a, a singer called Ricky Sorsa, Finnish guy. He was also in the Eurovision once. It was like Finland's Rod Stewart. Basically. Ah, okay, yeah. And I, I was with him for eight, eight months, and then I joined Gringos Locos, which was the like the, the bluesy hard rock band. Ah, I, okay. I, I met everybody who played in that band in Kitarapaya. Ah, okay. And they knew that I of could course. play, so they asked me, and then they asked me, do, do I know any singers? And I, Richard Johnson, my uh, friend from school, who was American, but he, he, he lived in Finland. He was a great singer, so I said, we have a band, come and check our singer. And that's how we both got into that band. And that band very quickly you know, we, we released the first album, we got very good reviews, and we were liked. But the drummer in the band, Miri Mietin, who later played yeah, with yeah, me, I know him, yes. yeah, and, and Muddy, uh, who also played with Wishbone, you know, yeah, yeah, after of, me. Of course. And uh, the bass player, they were all doing a lot of sessions. So we, we had kind of this kind of, oh, they're session musicians, so they, they can't be rock and roll guys. And the singer and I were a little bit like, it's the first time we've been in the studio. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, so we had a little bit. There was a little bit tension there with, with the true rockers, the hard rockers, that they're not really real. And it didn't help that the record label wanted to have uh, like a cowboy image. I didn't even know which way to put on a Stetson at that time. <laughs> but uh, that band very quickly got a deal in Polygram International and, and a big deal. Oh, okay. And that was televised on the, even on the news in Finland. I remember standing there with a glass of champagne wondering what the hell is going on now, <laughs> you know. And then we toured in Europe and in America, but as things go, Polygram International folded and a lot of artists lost their labels, as did we. We got signed to Atlantic Records in the States. Tom Dowd produced one of our albums. 
And this was the beginning of the 80s? That is, middle eight, of the 80s? Yes, this would be 89. 87 Gringos Locos started. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, working with Tom Dowd was a fantastic experience, man. He, he had stories. I mean, he produced Derek and the Dominoes, Skinner, Cream, you know, everybody. So he had loads of stories. But he also insisted on mixing the album, and that was a big mistake because oh, okay. it didn't sound that good. So we went to America to tour. We were supposed to tour with a female hard rock artist that was quite popular at the time. I forgot, I can't remember her name. And we got off the plane and our manager stood there and said, that I got some bad news. She canceled the whole tour. Oh. So we were like, oh. But I managed to get us 10 club dates through America and, and send them. We stayed in Los Angeles for a while, played five, five or six shows there. But okay. I guess that at that point, I already knew that you know, it was <laughs> that going was it. down. But as soon as I, the band quit, or we just stopped in, in I think in 1990, in the same year I met Jore Marjaranta, who was the singer of Leningrad Cowboys. Ah, okay. And we bonded and started to write music together for any kind of project we could get together. And he asked me, actually, after the last Gringos Logos gig, on a Saturday, on a Sunday, the phone rang and he asked me, can you come and audition for, for uh, Leng 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 Cowboys? Cowboys. Okay. And I was like, okay, well, I don't really know what you play, what, because I'd seen them at some big festivals and they had a big, spectacular show, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to run around stage with that <laughs> hair and the shoes. And, but I joined and it was also a lot of fun, a lot of fun, but to be honest, the 90s and the time with then Greg Cowboys is a little, a little bit like the 60s for all hippies. I can't remember anything. <laughs> there was a lot of vodka going around at that time. We did some big things and there was a lot of fun. But at the end, I got really tired of putting all that on. And sometimes we were, you know, asked... These were some kind of wigs to wear? Yeah, there was wigs that you kind of glued into your oh, hair and, and okay. with hairspray and hair dryers. And that explains why there's not so much left anymore. <laughs> but... Yeah, no. we used to say, well, if the hair is that long and the shoes is that long, what do you think? <laughs> but <laughs> the first time, first gig I had, you know, the shoes were this long. Yes, I uh, You're nervous before the gig. I quickly go to the toilet. Now try to get close to where you're peeing with those things. <laughs> it's, it's not easy. It's it was not easy. Freaking out. You have to and going upstairs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, backwards. Yeah. Like the, the letter of success, yeah. yes. But, I mean, we had, we did the... On, we were on, in, on tour in Germany and, and someone put on a tape by the Red Army Choir Orchestra from Russia. That's 150 people, like yeah. orchestra, 48 people, and the rest were singers. And we just put that tape on to see if we could, you know, get an idea of, or a new cover idea or something. And we had our record label guy with us, Finnish guy, and, and we were kind of, do we have to listen to this shit now? <laughs> and then he said, just play a concert with them and get over with it. And I'm like, hmm, not a bad idea. Yeah. And we did that in, in, in Helsinki for 70,000 people. It was a, on the Senate Square, it was a free concert. We expected 15,000. It was 70,000 people. It was filmed and after that we did the Nokia Balalaika show in Berlin. We did in Sweden a couple of big things. And yes, we, I remember that. And then we were in MTV Awards as well between Rolling Stones and Aerosmith. <laughs> and that's when I saw that those guys are quite small. <laughs> and they looked at us like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> I remember there was a, I'd walk around with my guitar and Keith Richards' guitar tech said, hey, do you want to see Keith Richards' uh, guitars? I said, yeah, that would be cool. And it was a room like this, full of Telecasters. <laughs> I, and he, hadn't, he hadn't, hasn't decided which one to use for playback yet. <laughs> I yeah. see. And the Aerosmith guys also like, they're, they're tiny, they're really small guys. Or maybe it's just Scandinavians at all, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, many good memories, many good things with them. But in the end, I left because I wanted to do something else, play the music I was playing with a band called Guitar Slingers. I don't know if you remember, I think I gave you some CDs way back. Yeah, yeah. It was like AOR rock party music. And we tried in Germany as well, but we also had 
seriously bad luck. We came over to do a festival tour with Status Quo and then uh, Richard Parfit got ulcer and they had to cancel the whole tour. Oh. We were stranded with three cl uh, club gigs here and we went back home. and just So we tried again and we uh, supported Wishbone Ash, really 98 maybe, okay. for 22 shows. And that's how I met Andy Powell and the guys in Wishbone Ash. They invited my, my trio over. 99 to play at their fan convention mm -hmm. and from there I was invited to go and play in, in the States with them and back next year in England and for the, their 30th anniversary I was to support band or special guest or whatever you want to call it and then when they came to Finland in 2000 January or was it 2001 well doesn't matter I noticed that the band was tired and the guitar player singer who was in the band uh, just looked completely uninterested. Oh, okay. And I wondered, okay, what's going on here? And when they left, there was the last gig on their European tour. And two weeks later, Andy Powell called me and asked me if I wanted to join. Now at this time, I'd already been with my trio in, in, in Germany supporting Thin Lizzy and Leonard Skinner, and I had been offered a record deal and I was very happy. And I scraped all that and decided I'm gonna join Wishbone Ash. So there I was four years with them. It was a great time, and that's we met yeah, many times during yeah. that. Yeah, 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 I remember that. Yeah. Then I left that and wanted to continue with my own stuff in 2004 or five. And like now, this year I'm releasing my 18th, 18th, 18th solo album. album. Great. Yeah. So. Yeah. Unfortunately, all Amazing. the tours, Amazing. all the tours, yeah, all Musicians the tours have been cast. Yeah, it, it's you know. I meet, sometimes you meet your old classmates and, and they look, so oh, what do you do? Well, I'm playing. What do you do for a living then? <laughs> it's like, Musician? I'm yeah. doing what I wanted since I was 11. Yeah. What are you doing? Working your ass off at your office. Is that really what you wanted to do? I might not be rich, but my heart is rich and my soul is rich. Yeah. And I, you know, I could do with more money, but it's not the most important thing in the life. Yeah. yeah. One thing we left out until now is amplifiers. Yeah. So it's your fault again. <laughs> <laughs> it's my fault again. Yeah. I, I started with Marshalls, as I said. Then I used Mesa Boogie for a while. Yeah. And then I got in touch with Engel. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. You. And that's actually a funny story because I saw Richie Blackmore when he started using Engel. Ah, okay. The last Rainbow Tour in yeah. Finland, maybe 97. And he, he had the first chords he took, Spotlight Kid. I was like, this is not Marshall. What is mm -hmm. this? And the guitar sound was just fantastic. And I saw Engel. Wow, I've never heard of them. Mm -hmm. And then Leningrad Cowboys went to... Now, this was in 94 or 95. Then Leningrad Cowboys went to, uh, to Denmark to make an album. And they had the same amp, Engel Savage. But it had like two rows of buttons, billions of options. I just, and the engineer said, you have to try this amp. And I had my modified vintage Marshalls with me. And I said, no, I don't want to, it's too many buttons. <laughs> and then one day when he was supposed to record solos, I came in there and he gave me the lead here. And I thought it was my gear connected there. Ah, okay. I took the first chord and what the fuck? And I was completely blown away. And I looked in the manual. There was no email at that time, so the fax number. So I sent the fax from the studio. Hi, I'm the guitar player from Leningrad Cowboys. My name is Ben Granfeld. I would really be interested in endorsing Engel amps. And I tried this amp and blah, blah, blah. And I got a fax back the same day. I said, OK, can you send us some, some music? We don't really know Leningrad Cowboys. <laughs> okay. So what I did, I got a car big cardboard box put three Leningrad Cowboy CDs. I had made three solo CDs by that time, two Guitar Slinger CDs, a six pack of Leningrad Cowboys beer, <laughs> a liter of Leningrad Cowboys vodka. That's the most important yeah, thing. Yeah, and then, then a movie that I'd been in with Leningrad Cowboys movie, and I sent it to, to <laughs> Germany. And a week later, the uh, fax came back, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, I worked with Engel for a long time, but then, I mean, I met Thomas Blug, at the uh, uh, Frankfurt Fair many times, and I admire his playing and his tone with Hughes and Kettner. 
And I remember when he released the Amp 1, and to be completely 100% honest, I thought it looked like a toy. I'm not going to try that. Yeah. That's not it. And for many years, he, well, two or three years, he said, you have to try it. And you told me to try it. Yeah. And I came here on one tour. Yeah, I thought about uh, just touring in clubs. Yeah. It might be a useful tool. Yeah. Not but so not, much luggage to carry no, around. Not only that, but you changed the pickup on my Les Paul and I had to try it. Yeah. You said, plug into this. Yeah. And then I went and I took one chord and the other band members just, what's that, Ben? <laughs> and I couldn't sleep. That was in, in September or October. I couldn't sleep until Christmas when I decided I'm going to buy blue amps. I'm going to sell all my tube amps. Okay. That's the best decision I've ever done. I can carry my own gear in. Yeah. Pedal board and, and amp on the pedal board on my back. Cabinet in one hand, double guitar case in the other hand. And off we go. Off we go. Yeah. And the tone is huge. And I'm never going back to anything else anymore. I'm, I'm completely blown away. Wonderful. Yeah. And that was, again, thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, yeah, go ahead, try it. I don't yeah. eh. And then I did. Some guys use it. Just try it. <laughs> yeah. It can't it, be it, that bad. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I, I wasn't unhappy with my tone with Engel. Yeah. But this was just melodic relief. It's yeah. one of my albums. I guess called. <laughs> this amp is different. That's what it is, basically. Many people come to the store and compare it to, to Fenders or, or Marshalls. And I guess it has an, its own sound. It's not so much like it sounds definitely like the other one, but it has its own style. It That's what I'm feeling. Yeah, it has its own character. Yeah. But, you know, to be honest, if, if you hide it behind a wall here and fake into a Marshall and, and you dial in a good loud tone from the amp one and say it's the Marshall, I would go, okay, cool, that's a yeah, good Marshall. Yeah, yeah. So that, it's that convincingly good. And it reacts to your playing, to your touch, as we spoke earlier, the touch is probably the most important thing with your guitar when you play. Yeah. So that I'm, I think I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Kloppmann pickups and blue amps. Yeah, what, what kind of pickups are you using? Well, that's embarrassing. The Blue set. <laughs> the Blue set. <laughs> no, I have. But the you have. A uh, the Blue set and then the Tilcaster. Yeah, the, the Tilcaster on yeah, the bridge. Because yeah, that's I, what I play a lot with my. But fingers. you're using the Blue One set. Yes. Yes. The it's developed from the ST60. Yeah. It's a well, little you more chimey. You put them in it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that is my my philosophy with things. If I st if I as a player start to analyze too much of what's inside an amp or what has what kind of magnets on the pickups because if you tell me that hey ben i think this would work for you and i put yeah, it yeah. In, and i think it sounds great but then when you go oh these are the alnico magnetic poles with this copper wire 1.75 megahertz minus 20. <laughs> it doesn't matter i don't care yeah. if it grows grass inside an amp as long as it sounds as great yeah, as it does yeah. the same thing with i mean you every pickup you've given to me has worked i, the, I have one maple Next strat, which has the 54 in the bridge, I think. Yeah. And that is Not unbelievably mixture, but good. That's good. Very, very good. Very big, round tone. I'm, I'm you know, we, we worked a little bit with humbuckers because I was for a long time like a fan of this. Well, Seymour Duncan and Jeff Beck has been yeah. my favorite. But we worked a long time on, on different ones. And then you gave me one for my, for my Les Paul now that I'm like, that's it. Yeah, that's a, 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 a modification of the HB60. It is the HB60 now, and uh, it's almost the same pickup that Kuddle from the Tortenhausen is using. Okay. So that's a, a handsome Les Paul bridge pickup that's still sounding PIF-wise, but just a little I, I, more muscles. I wouldn't know what it was, but it sounds great. Yeah, <laughs> great. So yeah. I was quite proud that you said for the first time, oh, this, this is a humbucker for the Les Paul that yeah, I can it, use. So no, it, it's I was very happy to hear that. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that if you now tell me, hey, I got something new, and I said, okay, you can change if you like, and then I would probably <laughs> like that too. But for now, this is, I have no complaints. Yeah. I'm, I'm very happy. Yeah. Never change a running system. No, but you know, you know, 
Thomas is coming out with Amp X and, and you, you do develop, develop new, hey, now I got better magnets minus 25 plus 24. <laughs> this is a little bit better, but I don't know if I would hear the difference, but I'm, I'm very happy, Thomas. Yes. That, it, and for we know what, where it depends on. It depends on the player, exactly. the strings, the pick, how you pick, how you feel. And the pickup is only one thing that has to carry all these signals to the amplifier. Yeah. So there's a lot about the tone that's developed on, on, others, on the other points of, and the, as, of the sound yeah, chain. And as soon as that chain is good, and the player is happy, the music becomes so much better. Yeah. So much better. And you're much more relaxed when you play, you don't stress. You know, I'm, I personally feel like I'm in a phase where I'm playing better than ever before and I'm happier about my playing better than before. And it's all, you know, it takes years to develop and to know what you like and what you want. Yeah. So. But then I'm so old already that <laughs> it will be over soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. You will have another. Well, I hope so. Few Just decades. I have nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Okay. Is that it, Ben? Thank you, Cloppy. <laughs> Thanks. Benny for and being Cloppy. Here. Benny and Cloppy. <laughs> yeah.